City Council study session. And again, Mr. Thompson is excused. The first item on our agenda is to review the items on the agenda for the July 2nd regular council meeting. So please refer to that document. Um, I do have a request, a blue card to speak on uh, in support of, I think, oh, never mind. I don't think they wish to speak. This uh, Mr. Adams has uh, filed a blue card uh, in support of the Mesa Place Parks Bond. Is that correct, Rich? I think that's a yes. Okay. So uh, looking at the agenda for Monday night, first several items are liquor license applications. Item five are purchase contracts. Oh, you thank you very much. Recognize that too. Yes. Um, as those who have been paying attention know, our last study session, we held a, an executive session, and there was the consensus at the conclusion of that was to uh, put on our agenda for Monday night the appointment of Alicia Lawler as a city magistrate. Um, again, eminently qualified. We're, we're very proud of our municipal court system. We have some really amazing judges, and, and uh, Ms. Lawler is going to be an excellent addition to that. So we look forward to swearing her in. So uh, on Monday night, uh, that's the, our, the first item. We'll, we'll actually swear her in, and, and she'll uh, yes. be appointed to the bench. Okay, right. great. Uh, after that, we'll approve various liquor licenses and then move on to purchase contracts under agenda item five. Council, anything you'd like to pull off that agenda? If not, six are various resolutions. And seven is setting a public hearing for other resolutions. Eight is introducing various ordinances. And nine is taking comment on ordinances. Yes, Mr. Freeman. Can I make a comment on 9A? Of course. Uh, thank you. You know, I want to do a shout out to uh, people who uh, the Flying Acres Historic District uh, was established there, an applicant in this process, and there's uh, several people who worked really hard on that. Flying Acres is just west of Center Street, uh, and, and I can't remember the exact, but 8th Street or 7th Place right in there just west. But uh, many who worked on that was uh, Amy Mahoney, a resident who initiated the uh, Flying Acres Historic District. Uh, process and helping with the document documentary was also Lori Oshesky. She's a longtime proponent of historic preservation and work in that area. But they they worked tirelessly for over a year to bring this to fruition. So I appreciate their efforts in District One, and this sets uh, a great standard for other historic areas. And this was initiated back uh, the neighborhood back in uh, World War II, 1948 time. So. Uh, they were able to apply and get this consent. So I appreciate their work. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, currently on the consent agenda, under agenda item six, is putting various items on the ballot. And I know that we have some folks uh, in attendance today in support of, of those uh, questions. Uh, it, it includes uh, the park bond, the public safety bond. Uh, I think we've already mm -hmm. taken action to put home rule on the ballot and the quarter cent sales tax for public safety personnel. Uh, but the, the, again, the things we are adding on, on Monday, various items to our, our ballot for the November election. Uh, obviously, we have an August election with where we have city council uh, decisions being made. But uh, wouldn't surprise me. I, I wonder if we ought to leave it on the consent or take it off just for the purposes of uh, educating the electorate as, as to what we're going to be talking about. Mayor, we would be glad um, at the beginning yeah. of the meeting just to kind of go through that list again or present it, and we can do that. So in addition to the two, um, as you mentioned, Mayor, the public safety public public safety um, bond uh, projects, which we, we can certainly provide a list of those, the, um, the projects for the parks and cultural, we can provide that list. You mentioned um, also in support of Mesa Plays is the item of, Section 613, uh, the allowing for the expenditure of public funds uh, in addition uh, above and beyond the 1.5 million. And then also in support of Mesa Plays, the increase in the bed tax from 5% to 6%. Yeah, I, I think obviously we want the voters to have as much information as possible. That's why we publish publicity pamphlets and, and uh, 
Obviously, we can't advocate now that it's going on the bond or on the, the, the ballot. We can't campaign, but we can provide information. And you can't campaign here. You can campaign oh, right. later. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, uh, many of us can and will be campaigning in, in, in uh, uh, taking a position on these. But it seems appropriate that maybe at the outset of the meeting we do have we'll be glad uh, to do that, Mayor. provide uh, the facts so that voters know what we're doing. We can do that, Mayor. And then just, just a, another quick reminder, of the uh, sign ordinance is also included in 7A and 7B. Okay. Right. And we've had several public, here, public meetings on that, and I know it's gone through a big vetting process in the community, but it wouldn't surprise me if people have something to say about the sign ordinance as well. But currently everything's off the consent or on the consent agenda. All right. That's, uh, if we're done with that, then the next item on our agenda for this meeting is item two. That's to hear a presentation and provide direction on the proposed licensing of a structured sober living homes ordinance in Mesa. Um, we have present, we do have a presentation. Too. Yes, I think Tim and Charlotte are coming up. Oh, that's like, I saw people leaving it. <laughs> Damn, I get your <laughs> Welcome. Good morning. Good morning, Mayor and Council. How are you today? Great. Good. We're here to uh, uh, present our proposal for the Structured Sober Living Home Ordinance. Um, uh, we've all worked very hard on that, and the Attorney's Office has worked very hard on that, and we're here to present that today. The purpose of this uh, ordinance that we're proposing is to establish a licensing process that's going to protect the residents and stru uh, of structured sober living homes from operators who fail to op provide a supportive family-like living environment necessary to achieve and maintain the sobriety to create operation standards and benefit of the residents and protect the residents and surrounding neighbors um, from bad operators. Um, the proposed ordinance is going to require uh, many things and this we've uh, given some of the highlights here. Um, licensing of the operators. The managers of the homes are going to be, have to be certified and provide that proof to us at the licensing office. They will be, provide, they will be um, required to provide a good neighbor policy. Um, they'll have an operation plan including written intake procedures, relapse and discharge policy and maintenance of noise abatement. And they will have house rules um, for all of the houses as well. Um, the proposed ordinance will also require a house manager to be on premises 24-7. Um, there'll be an annual fire inspection for the home. Um, there is a revocation process for non-compliance, and uh, they will have Narcan on site and for proper uh, and proper training for the staff, as well as all the CP the, uh, the managers will be required to have uh, CPR and uh, uh, training as well. On um, applicability, the group residential group home for the is is, is actually a group residential home for the handicapped. Um, alcohol, they will be required to be alcohol free and drug free housing for individuals recovering from substance. Uh, um, use and disorders. It is a supervised setting. Um, it, it will promote independent living. Um, it, provo it provides structured activities and it's basically modeled, yeah. our ordinance is basically modeled after the uh, Phoenix and the Prescott ordinance that's already in existence. Mr. Smith, do you have something to add to that? Yeah, uh, Mayor and Council, I'll take a few more minutes and I'll, let me, and let me sort of unpack some of the thing on the, on that last slide on, um, uh, we did, uh, in large part, mimic this from the Prescott ordinance, um, and uh, mm -hmm. because I think it's a good example of um, following the state statute. They have also had it in effect for over a year, um, and so we're also looking at their actual implementation and the procedures. And let me just talk about, you know, there's some questions regarding applicability. Um, it, it will apply to existing homes. Um, but in order to give those homes an opportunity to uh, get the training and for their staff and also uh, for compliance, uh, just like Prescott, we're going to mimic the fact that the ordinance will have a delayed effective date by 90 days, and then they'll have 60 days to submit their application. Um, there's actually a typo in the current draft. We've caught that, um, and we'll fix that. But it'll be a 90, 60-day uh, process. Um, just so you know, that mimics what uh, Prescott did. Also um, on applicability, it's important to um, realize that this, this is applicable in the same sense of um, our ordinance is applicable in other 
on, on other situations. I'll, I'll just do it by example. Um, we, ha we have a separation requirement. The separation requirement is 1,200 feet. It only becomes applicable if you have six or more residents. Um, that goes back to a definition of what is a group home for the handicap and what is uh, either in our code and uh, you'll see in other city codes, either directly or indirectly, a definition of what's considered family, and that's the reason why you have that is because of uh, federal law. Uh, the city of Mesa, that, that the number in which um, the, the separation requirement becomes applicable um, is six. So you have to have mm -hmm. six residents of, uh, um, in the home. Um, and, and just, you know, that's the same as Phoenix and Scottsdale and Chandler, they have the six. Um, and, and there's some cities that have one number higher and some um, one lower, and so there's a little variability, and uh, we'll, we'll also be looking at, at that in the future. Um, and that's a different process, and that's within the zoning code, and there's, there's a fair amount involved in that. Um, and so, uh, so this, this ordinance, just like Phoenix's, will be applicable when there's six or more um, residents within the home. Um, and so- Mr. Smith, does that include the live-in manager? So it does not, and so you, you have to get six residents um, in the home, and then the, then the requirements, all the requirements kick in. And so, um, again, that's the same as Phoenix. Um, Prescott has it has the, the, so, the so numbers. Did, did Mr. Freeman ask of my question? So in other words, you have to have a, a home that has one, the minimum requirement is you have a live-in manager, and then if you have six or more residents that are receiving treatment in that home, then this ordinance would kick in. I, I, I think of it first, so the predicate, how you, you phrase the question, right. so, and I'm probably being too precise. Um, you first have six residents, then you have the obligation of having a, uh, a house manager, okay. separation of 1,200 feet, and all the other requirements that are up there that all mimic Prescott. Um, and, and, and so, and that, and that requirement of six is the same as other cities. Um, other cities don't have a structured sober living ordinance, they just have a separation requirement at, at at six, we are adding the structured sober living. There's two other cities that add the structured sober living requirement. That's Prescott and Phoenix. We're becoming the third city. Um, Phoenix is actually doesn't actually begin until next month, so they actually haven't even um, implemented theirs. And so I just want to I want I want the, the public to sort of have a reasonable expectation. And this goes back to you know last week when we talked about the fact that the Senate bill um, is really the long term solution because it offers a greater breadth. Um, a potential applicability based off how uh, um, the state adopts its regulations. And so... Well, uh, what's the residency requirement for the Senate bill? How many... It, it does not have one. And so it'll, uh, the regs are yet to be written. And so I'm assuming that the, that will be specified within the regulations. Um, okay. Uh, are, are you finished? Because we have a couple of questions for you. Yeah. I, okay. Mr. Mr. Go Freeman ahead. and then Mr. Luna. So if they have less than six residents, then you're telling the sober living residences could be next to each other? Yes. In, in yeah. Mesa and Phoenix and then in, in, in other cities. I just want yeah. to understand that as yeah. well as is there a licensing mm -hmm. process for if there's less than six no. residents? So unbeknownst to us, you could have uh, sober living homes less than six next to each other on a, on a given street. That's correct. All right, thank you. And, and, and that's why, you know, the cities and the league supported the Senate bill so much is to look at, um, you know, a, a, a different solution that's going to be statewide, because that's true throughout, throughout all the cities. I guess one last thing, this is kind of some gap coverage until the uh, legislation kicks in and then it's I, written. I think that's a fair way to describe it. Mr. Luna. I had a question on what does that mean, good neighbor policy? Uh, can you elaborate on that? What is? <clears throat> Mayor, Vice Mayor Luna, the good neighbor policy will include items like um, making sure the residents the, or the surrounding neighbors have contact information for the operator and the house manager. There'll be policies and procedures to address neighbors' concerns and how they'll address those concerns. Um, so that's some of the items that will be in there, basically addressing the neighbor's concerns, surrounding neighbor's concerns that they may have with the um, structured sober living home. Just to follow up, so will, you dis will this be disseminated among the neighborhoods and the neighbors, uh, the policy, contact information? Is this something that will be done? 
voluntarily or how does that happen? How will the residents around the sober mm -hmm. living homes know that uh, this is available to them should there be any issues related to the, the homes? Yeah. So as part of the mayor, vice mayor Luna, as part of the application process, the structured sober living home operator would submit to the city their good neighbor policy. So if a neighbor has a question about the good neighbor policy, they could either ask the um, operator for the policy or they could ask the city through a public, public records request for that, for that document. Sorry, Jim, Charlotte. Sure. Um, but this is only applicable to six or more residents is what we're talking about. Correct. So less than that, um, there's no inspection process, no uh, compliance process. You don't even, we don't even know they really exist <coughs> until there's an issue from the neighbors, uh, unless it comes forward. So I'm looking at enforcement or code compliance. Is there, I mean, how are we going to, if it's six or more, how are we going to monitor that other than an annual fire inspection. Uh, so I guess my question is, how are we going to monitor six or more residents? Mayor, Council Member Freeman, that'll be all through my office. So once the application is done, then we'll be notifying those departments, and they'll be setting up processes and procedures within those areas to follow up and, and ensure that there's compliance. And any complaints that would come through our office would be forwarded as well to those departments so that there would be an inspection process. Okay, I, I know we're all trying to understand this and get in compliance with the federal law. I'm not comfortable with it personally, okay. but that's just the way it's going to have to play out uh, until the actual law is written and, and uh, from the, at the state level. And I guess DHS is doing that? Yes. Okay, thanks. So the way we know if there's six or more is they self-report, right? If, uh, so if a neighborhood sees activity that they think uh, is evidence of in excess of six residents, that would also trigger a, a, a call to the city and we could investigate that. Yes. Okay. Uh, now, Mr. Smith and, I, and, and uh, Charlotte, I know we've, the Prescott ordinance is five or more and the Phoenix ordinance is six or more. And, right. and Prescott uh, got to the number five by retaining uh, an expert to do some additional research and, and prove up to the federal government that there's a legitimate reason for it to be five, correct? And we've retained the same expert? We are in the process of retaining that same expert, Mayor. So we will be, and we're looking at a few other 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 items too. Um, I don't want to create, you know, an undue expectation. Um, we are adopting the ordinance that is um, the same as Prescott other than that one number. It is the same as, in effect, as the Phoenix with the same number. Um, but we, we are in the process of retaining that expert, and we will look at both that and some other opportunities. Okay. <clears throat> so that work and, needs to occur. Yeah. And uh, with, But there is the potential that we could come back and amend the ordinance if, uh, if we feel like we have the justification to do that? Correct. Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and the ordinance can't take place for another, we have a 90-day a, a uh, period before it kicks in and then a 60-day period before in order to come into compliance. So we're still five months down the road. In the meantime, the clock is ticking on the state adopting the regs or creating the regs, the regulations, so that the state statute can then come in and preempt us and take over. Correct. Okay. Right, and this, this, this ordinance will sunset as soon as they adopt their regulations. They, they will, by law, they'll preempt us and, and we have an automatic sunset provision within this ordinance, so we won't have to come back to uh, eliminate this ordinance in the future. Okay. All right, we, we do have, uh, yes, I'm sorry, what Mr. Question? Heredia. <clears throat> do we have information on how Prescott is, because you mentioned they've been doing this for a year, right? Is there any information how it's going for them? We've, we've spent a tremendous amount of time with the Prescott City Attorney. I've talked with them um, at length. Uh, uh, I have, Charlotte have, and so that's also why, yes, they've implemented it. Um, we've uh, we've gotten a lot of feedback from them, and so that's um, uh, that's why we've gone with uh, mimicking oh, Prescott yeah. ordinance. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we spend a lot of time with them. Okay, uh, I know there may be more council discussion, but we do have a few blue cards on this item. So, are, do we have any other questions of, of staff before we proceed to hearing from the blue cards? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, four blue cards. I'll just take them in the, in the order that I have them. Uh, Janice Genevois.
I'm sorry, Janice, you put a question mark down. Did I compel no. you to speak before you were committed to doing that? No, I wasn't sure. I okay. was hoping to hear my, my neighbors first. Thank you for, I'm not a morning person, but good morning. I'm Janice Genevois, 150 North Wilbur. Um, who can I address my questions to this morning? on this topic. Why don't you just list them and then we'll see if we can ad address uh, okay. answer them for you. I mean, I, I, I read the ordinance and I, I think that's wonderful. I appreciate the speed in which you guys have looked at this. So I do wanna make it very clear that it will not help um, the um, downtown area for the most part. Um, I j just did some quick, goo well, I spent, Quite a lot of time um, in public records and contacting uh, planning and zoning and all kinds of uh, everybody really to try to find out how many of these homes are in, in the square mile. And um, Christine Zulanka at planning and zoning said they used to keep a list, but they apparently had some kind of a lawsuit and they found out that other cities don't keep a list. So there's no longer any kind of list, which concerns me because whoever wants to open up one of these houses with five people or less, they fill out one form and they pay a thousand dollars. So somebody's getting those forms, but in a real quick Google search that I did, I got more than 50 of these homes in the 85201 and 85203 zip code area on my phone like that. And in doing my research, I found out that the um, apartment uh, lined up to my $50,000 pool over here, 151 Hibbert is a psychiatric hospital now. I did not know that. I was not happy to find that. This ordinance that you wrote is a great ordinance and I really think it has a lot of good features, but we the places that are setting up in our district are five or less. They, are, they start with six and then when they find out the regulation, so the pearly beds are five, Eris is five, so it won't protect us at all. And um, um, so one of the questions that I had, one of the problems w that I see with this ordinance, Mr. Smith, is that we're putting everything under sober home. And there's actually seven different kinds of homes. It is very different to be next door to a developmentally disabled home. You have a Down syndrome individual, a person with cerebral palsy. That's a very different picture than five male adult felons. And so to clump them all together, I think is a, an issue that needs to be addressed. I think that each type of home needs to be distinguished on its own. And um, I just, uh, can you speak to that, Jim? Uh, Janice, you're out of time. So oh, okay. I'll tell you, if you have other questions, why don't you list them uh, okay. and then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll try to get answers for you uh, during the course of the discussion. Okay, um, I just do wanna continue to ask that the city of Mesa consider putting a stay on adding any more of these homes with five people or less until we have protection by the new Senate bill or some other ordinance. We would really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is Anita Duncan. Good morning. My name is Anita Escobedo Duncan. I'm at, uh, a new build on 148 North Pomeroy. And we just have moved in a week ago. And um, we went through a lot to get our permit. It's taken us a year to get to the point we're at. Um, and uh, a lot of my questions have been answered. I'm concerned about um, the, I know we have a vulnerable uh, set of population with um, our sober living homes, but we also have vulnerable, vulnerable excuse me, um, population with 
our seniors who live in the neighborhood and our children who live in the neighborhood as well. Um, so hopefully we'll be um, addressing that. Um, some of the questions I have have already been answered, but my main question is how are you going to differentiate um, all of these um, different types of homes with what Janice said with the correctional transitional housing facilities that I think are zoned in, I saw in your zoning, to halfway houses, to the sober living homes, um, to boarding homes, how are you going, are they all classified differently with different definitions and, and are they all going to be addressed? Um, someone mentioned, well, all of our homes, our six homes in our neighborhood, we could actually then make them into sober living homes. We wouldn't do that to each other if there's no guidelines as to, you know, five or less, one right after the other after the other. Um, but we wouldn't do that to our neighbors. Um, we're long-time residents there, most of us. Um, mm -hmm. So that's what I was wondering about, the different types of homes and how they're going to be addressed. Say, so, thank you. Thank you, Anita. Well, we will address that question of Mr. Smith. Uh, Barbara Sutphin. Uh, Barbara, Sut Barbara Valenzuela Sutfin. I live at 1910 East Maryland Avenue, Mesa, Arizona. Some of my questions have already been answered, but I still have a question about a correctional transitional housing facility. And I'm wondering if the, uh, the house on 138 would fall under that category because these gentlemen are being released from prison and then they're going into this halfway house. And that's the way it was described on Valjean's uh, website. So correctional uh, transitional housing facilities have different uh, standards by which they, mu they must establish themselves according to the, to the, uh, the city code that the city code that is now in, in force, not the new one. And according to them, uh, they shouldn't be in a residential setting. It's, I think, uh, chapter 31, 11, uh, yeah, 11, 31, 12 on your zoning ordinance. And, in, and they're not allowed to be within 500 feet of a preschool or a kindergarten or a park or a church. Now, within the 500 feet area, we have two parks, well, mostly the park across the street the firefighter, the one that's right next to the firefighter's uh, building. And then there's a YMCA across the street. Right next to the, the YMCA is the uh, Presbyterian Church, and the Presbyterian Church houses a Head Start facility. So if we go strictly by what is written already in the code, it appears to me that that house would not meet the qualifications for that particular site. The other consideration that I've taken, that I've been thinking about, that we need to explore here, is that the house is only, I think, 816 square feet. So, if five men, because they're going to meet, they're going to meet the five man minimum, okay, um, plus a manager that's supposed to be there 24/7. How are they going to fit in all those people? It is a very small house with only one bathroom. So that's another consideration. And if I were looking at it as a parent, having my child in a situation like that, I would be a little bit upset because that's a, that's a very small setting. I mean, that's almost the size of a small prison cell. When you look at it, when they're going to put two, two beds per bedroom, and there's only two bedrooms, one bath, and a small living room that's combined with a dining room and a very tiny kitchen. So, and I'm also concerned about the fact that will they receive the proper um, follow-up for their, for their problems? Granted, they are close to the light rail, but the light rail doesn't go to the, the um, I think he mentioned in his website that people will be getting some kind of help from Community Bridges, and Community Bridges is located off of Broadway in Bellevue. So the light rail doesn't go that way. So they will be having to either ride a bicycle or walk. Uh, it's true that the parole, parole offices are close to that site, 
But there's a lot of considerations that need to be taken place. If, these, if you're just looking at how the men are going to be treated and how we as a community are going to be impacted, I think in this particular situation we both lose. The only person that's going to come out the winner is the person that actually is going to run and manage and collect the money from those people. So I would like those things to be taken into consideration because I would like to know that uh, we are thinking about everybody in, the, in this particular community, not just the, the residents there, but also the people that are going to be housed there. And I am, the, the, the site is very small, and I don't know where, if they were to have counseling, where they would hold their counseling meetings. So those are just food for thought. And I would like to know if anybody can answer the question, do they fall under the CTHF category at present time? Uh, thank you, Barbara. Your time is up, but we will address that question. Thank you. Uh, last card I have is from Jen Duff. Good morning, Mayor and Council. Um, I really just have a question rather than a statement, and it is regarding the definition of so many similar homes that are impacting our neighborhoods in downtown. So we're having to define, you know, regulate and, re and registration to look at all of these different types of homes and take them into consideration and how we approach that and how they affect the neighborhoods. So some of them are, you know, the sober living homes, which we we're talking about this morning. Halfway houses, which is a transitional place for felons. Um, recovery houses, three-quarter houses, the correctional transition mm -hmm. housing facilities that were just brought up. So there's, um, we can regulate and look at sober living houses, but we also have to look at the definition of these others and how they impact and look at it comprehensively. So that's just my only comment to look at it and the impact in neighborhoods overall. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. So, Mr. Smith, uh, there were a few questions raised there. Um, I don't know if you're writing them down, but uh, I, ha I think I have them. Okay. Why don't you go ahead and take a crack at what you what okay. you just heard, please? Uh, thanks, Mayor and Council. Um, and, and I hear the frustrations of the community. Just you know, that's why we uh, took this up so quickly. Um, the reason why we we did structured sober living, and maybe sort of uh, the question that was sort of why did we distinguish and um, and between the different types is because that's what the state statute authorized municipalities to do. And so that's what we're doing there. And the sort of the distinguishing um, between the different types and the definition sort of flowing together. So I'll handle the, but maybe both those questions together. So we, we, we did structured sober living because that's what the state statute authorizes and we've followed. And if you look at the definition, it follows largely what's within the state definition. Um, uh, as far as the definitions, we have looked at that and we do intend to come back as part of our process um, uh, to refine the definitions. Um, as to a particular house in both the definitions, the problem with the, with the definitions and that this is what I think the community struggles and it's not unique to Mesa, it's, it's with all communities is this, is, is that um, you can have a, somebody that's coming out of, uh, out of jail or prison that might qualify for a, uh, the correctional transitional housing but they're also recovering from uh, drug and alcohol. And so they're then considered to be disabled under federal law. And so they'll, and if they house only those types of people, then they're gonna qualify as uh, a sober living home. And so this is, if you look at, if you remember sort of like Venn diagrams from uh, school, the problem with the, the, the definitions and it's intentional is this because is that they overlap and because they have to because of federal law. Um, and so that's when you'll see that in other, other communities also, and the concepts of, um, of, of both sober living and um, people coming out of, uh, coming out of uh, correctional facilities. So I don't know whether a particular house would qualify as a structured sober living until you really look at it. And so, but that's inherent in the very nature of it. Um, and, and it's, uh, you know, in, in large, large part it's inherent in the nature of the federal law that's been sort of handed down to the state and to municipalities to have to deal with um, and the courts that have interpreted it and, and require us to treat um, this just like the other you know I read the litany off and uh, I have um, you know race color religion sex disability familiar status or national origin and the courts have recognized this to be a disability so it's put in that same list and so that's 
that's the sort of the, the limitations that we're within. And so, um, uh, so I hear the frustrations, but I also, we're looking at the solution that we can within the, the, the realm that we have. And so um, that's why we went with Prescott. That it, the reason why it distinguishes because it mimics the state's, state statute in large part. Um, as far as the moratorium, um, in fact, if you remember the case, I, I, I won't quote it again, the case that I cited back um, last week, that case, the city did impose a moratorium and then they, they tried to prevent them. Um, they got sued, it got overturned, um, they got sued for damages. Mm -hmm. The damages and attorney's fees were over $9 million in that one lawsuit in that one city from those structured sober living homes that sued uh, for um, preventing them from operating for a while. And so, you know, a moratorium, the state statute State statutes allow municipalities to have a moratorium. I'm only aware of one circumstance when it occurs. It's for new build when you don't have water or you can show that you cannot provide police or fire. There's all sorts of requirements to make those findings and then there's limitations after that. And so, um, so I, you know, I've thought about that and I've looked at it. And so, you know, it's not, it's not because we haven't thought or, or thinking about this. Um, the definitions, we have looked at those and we are, the national, the expert that we're gonna hire, we're gonna look at that also. Um, but it, the, 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 the issue with the definition inherently comes back to the fact that the Venn diagrams overlap. And so we, we, will, we will look to clarify, but realize inherently that's at, at the, the core of it too. And so we are doing um, as, as much as uh, the other two cities are doing um, that are looking at structured sober living to try to address this problem. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. So uh, the reason we don't have different rules for the different types of homes, the oh. development, de developmentally disabled versus transitional living? We do have different definitions. So if you are just a cor correctional transitional housing and you, you're not treating people that are qualified as disabled, that is a different type of home. And then that that is not permitted in uh, John correct. Mayor Council, uh, it is different, it does have the description, but it does still start at that base of six residents or more before it falls into that category. If you are six residents or more, then you are limited to commercial industrial zones and you have to get a council use permit. But if you're five, which we understand the one to be on Pomeroy, then you're not covered and those can basically go any place just like the other types of group homes and group residential that we're talking about. So we do uh, have different rules for different categories of homes, but one of the things yeah. they have in common is this trigger of six or more yeah. residents. And like I said, we're gonna go back and look at that. Okay. Mr. Luna. Are there other homes that are regulated by the state? Uh, yes, I don't have the litany of those, but yes. Perhaps we might want to get that, see what is available, what, what regulations to occur. I also had a question on uh, homes less than five people. So will the new, this, the new Senate legislation, will that deal with homes less than six people? I think it can. It's ultimately what the regs say, and okay. that's why hopefully the public becomes involved with uh, that process. Okay. The, the statute doesn't get down to that granular level. Uh, one of the speakers a moment ago said that uh, there are, there is some licensing going on. I don't know if it's from the city or the state or the county where you write a check for $1,000, you can start a, uh, a facility. That's not us that they're writing the check for $1,000 to, is it? I don't, I, you know, that's, I don't know if presents that, Do we know? John. Uh, Mayor, Council, uh, that reference may have been to the group homes for the handicapped and the group homes. We do register those. I don't, I'm not sure what the fee is for that registration process. And so we, because we do have that 1,200 foot separation. So we do look at that to make sure they're maintaining that. But other than that, um, okay. we don't maintain a list of those. Uh, there are some basic inspections of those when they go in, but it's very minimal. And the, the occupancy trigger for that would be six as well? Correct. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, I, I, a couple of things I would just suggest is that, not again, this is an ordinance that, that is in place until the, the, the state ordinance, the state statute clicks in. I, the last time we talked about this, I told you that we're aggressively going to in, encourage the state to not wait uh, the 18 months or two years that, that the, they have to work on these. Uh, at the League of Cities and Towns Convention, we're adopting resolutions, and, and, and I would encourage you to join us in lobbying the state uh, to be timely in adopting these regulations as quickly as possible so that, and then as Mr. Smith indicated, if the state 
regulations come back and, and mimic, you know, the, the, the six or more that, that uh, the cities are using, I'm not sure that, uh, that the, the folks in neighborhoods are going to feel like there's been a whole lot accomplished. So there's maybe the lobbying efforts ought to be on, you know, on two prongs, to be as restrictive as possible and to be as, as quickly as possible adopted. And I promise you we, we will join in, in that effort. The other thing I, I would just say uh, to neighborhoods that are concerned is nothing uh, either in the state statute or the city ordinance makes illegal behavior legal. So if you see things in your neighborhood that are not uh, appropriate, call the police. Uh, and if, if there's illegal activity going on in these homes, call the police. Let's be very aggressive in enforcing the law. Uh, and uh, we encourage you to do that. Because, um, again, we don't want to allow or encourage or promote any criminal activity in our community. Um, but I, I guess that's the, this is all we can do for the time being, is my impression. Other, other comments? Yes, Mr. Freeman. I think, I think as we um, go forward, we talk about the residents, but we also need to remember there's a house manager, so it's always the resident plus one. And, and I have a concern, you know, with residents bringing up that you have an 860 square foot home with six people there. And that's kind of tight living quarters. So uh, I don't know what, we'll just have to, this is a work in progress and, and I, I appreciate staff moving forward rapidly on this. So th there'll be other comments from uh, council in the future, I'm sure. Uh, so again, did the ordinance that we're adopting, are we, when are we doing that? You're introducing it Monday and then you'll adopt it on the 9th. Okay. All right. Thank you. So there, there'll be more opportunity for public comment uh, Monday and again on the 9th when we do that. Uh, if there's nothing else, we'll move on to the next agenda item on, for today, and that's to acknowledge receipt of boards and minutes. Is there a motion to that effect? Thank you. And a second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Next is to hear reports on meetings and conferences attended. Yes. Uh, pursuant to Section 211B of the Mesa City Charter, and for the sole purpose of triggering the requirements under Section 211B1 and B2, I'm introducing an ordinance to amend the Mesa City Charter to stabilize the City of Mesa utility rates by restricting utility service revenue for use in support of providing utility services and protecting utility service assets and providing a cap on transfers of utility service revenue to the City of Mesa General Fund and authorizing the submission of such charter amendment to the electors of the city for adoption in accordance with Mesa City Charter requirements. I'll provide a copy to the city clerk at the conclusion of the meeting. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I uh, have something to report as well. I attended a meeting yesterday of the, the MAG um, uh, organization and that was pleased to receive an award on behalf of the city for the adoption of the text 911 program. Uh, and I just wanted to give a shout out to our, our police department and, and our fire department and our uh, emergency services dispatch folks who have worked very closely with MAG. Uh, it, for those who may not know, just a few months ago, uh, we acquired the ability to text 911 calls uh, that we didn't have previously. Uh, and that this was done at a regional level. and, and if you think about it, uh, a lot of younger people are more comfortable texting sometimes than calling. And a lot of people, if they're in an emergency situation, including domestic violence or other uh, scenarios that we can think of, it, it's more effective and more appropriate to text. And so uh, I was pleased to, uh, along with the other cities, uh, receive that award. Uh, and I just thought I'd, again, thank those at the city level who are involved in that and uh, remind us once again that that is a, the abil an ability that we have now. Yes, Mr. Luna. Uh, I just want to acknowledge uh, Chief Camelli, who, uh, congratulate her, she will be honorably selected as the Arizona Fire Chiefs Association, Ala, Alan Brunacci, uh, Brunacini, is that right? Brunacini. Brunacini, Fire Chief of Officer of the Year for 2018. So we want to acknowledge Mary. For Congratulations. <laughs> Very well deserved. Uh, I'm, I'm sure the, the national award is just uh, around the corner too. Thank you. Thanks. I just want to welcome uh, the Mesa Sister City students. Uh, I attended the uh, opening reception. Uh, 
I know our students from Mesa came back uh, recently uh, from their trips in, in Peru, Canada, New Zealand, uh, China, I think Mexico, uh, and we have students uh, who travel from those same countries here in Mesa, uh, and they're here for the next three weeks. So just want to welcome. Uh, they uh, woke up bright and early today uh, to attend our study session. Uh, so thank you, uh, and thanks for the, the Mesa City, uh, Sister Cities Board and families who make this happen. Uh, great work uh, that you all do to make this program uh, every year. So thank you and welcome to uh, City of Mesa. Thank you, and thank you for representing us, those of you who travel uh, to the other cities as well. Mr. Freeman. It's been a busy week. Uh, we had an open house in District 1, and it was well attended. Yeah. Uh, we had it over at Fire Station 218. We had probably 30-plus residents in the area attend. Uh, we had uh, great staff there as well, answered lots of questions, and uh, we, I just appreciate everybody working so hard, especially the council assistant and putting this all together. And I was pleased to join you in another community meeting with the Lehigh Crossing residents a couple of days ago. That again, thank you to the, the staff uh, for facilitating that. It was well attended and, and I think it was a very productive meeting. Yeah. Thank you, council. Any additional reports on meetings or conferences attended? Mr. Brady, can you help us with the schedule of future meetings? Yes. Mayor Council, we're getting close to um, our summer break. Um, we will have a, um, our meeting on Monday, July 2nd. There will be some items. Um, there will be um, uh, reviews of charter uh, positions will happen prior to the council meeting, so we'll have an early start for the study session on July 2nd. There will be no study session on July 5th, so we'll be reviewing the July 9th agenda on Monday, July 2nd. And then our final um, council meeting before the summer break will be Monday, July 9th. And that will also have an early start date uh, for council to have an opportunity to meet with um, charter appointed um, positions to do their reviews also on that day. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. If there's nothing else, is there a motion to adjourn this meeting? Thank you, Mr. Luna. All in favor, please say aye. 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 We are adjourned. <laughs>